So we are in Isaiah chapter 6. Actually, i got several different passages of Scripture that I wanted to share with you. We're just going to read the first three verses of Isaiah uh, chapter 6 to get started with. Uh, and here we go. Y'all ready? Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain or two he covered his face. With twain he covered his feet. And with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for the fact that you have called us, Lord, out of darkness and into your marvelous light. We thank you for the fact that you redeemed us with your precious blood. We thank you, Lord, that you sent a preacher. For how can they believe on him of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without a preacher? How beautiful is it of the feet of those that are sent to preach the gospel? We thank you, Lord, for that preacher, whoever it was. It might have been our sister, our mother, our best friend. But we thank you for that mouth that was willing to speak forth the truth of your gospel. And we thank you for your supernatural, miracle-working prayer. That, Lord, got power that when we prayed and we received you, Lord, you came came on the inside of us and you transformed our lives and we have never been the same. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. We pray, oh Lord God, that the whole earth would be filled with your glory. Amen. You know, there's one of the songs that I have and I don't remember the name, maybe to the king alone, I will give my life. But one of them says that it talks about that, that, that the whole earth is filled with his glory. There's a psalm actually that talks about that. And, uh, you know, during the millennial reign of Christ, I know that many of us have been talking about that. Aaron's been talking about it quite a bit. We were sharing it with some of the prisoners. But it's a, it's a common theme within the scripture. And part of what we've talked about that we would believe that, that there is something beyond this life. Sometimes it's difficult for us to believe that. Amen. But what a beautiful thing. You know, Isaiah chapter 11 speaks of the fact that during the millennial reign of Christ, that the that the spirit of the Lord is going to pervade the air. I've said this many times, but I want you to think about that. When we look at the news and we see the chaos and the confusion that's out here on the earth today, we need to understand that the word of God te teaches us. It says that that the, that there's a spirit that works in the children of disobedience. He's the prince of the power of the air. And that right now, currently where we are, the pervading spirit that's in the air is the spirit of the Antichrist. Now, that doesn't go for you and I. Hallelujah. You and I have been translated from the dominion of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. And you and I now have access to the power of the Holy Spirit to walk and to live in victory. We don't have to live under that kingdom of darkness anymore. And I don't know about you, but I'm so grateful for that. But you know what it really encourages me to think is that one day it's going to be a flip-flop. It's going to be a reversal. It's going to, no, it's going to even be better than that because, see, Satan is going to be locked in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. And Jesus is going to rule and reign on David's throne upon the literal earth is what the word of God says. Amen. And, and I was reading it in, in Isaiah 11 earlier around verse 9. It starts and it talks about the fact that, that the glory of the Lord or the, 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 the knowledge of God is going to fill the earth. Amen. And that the lion is going to is going to eat straw like an ox and that the wolf and the lamb are going to lie together and that a child would be able to put his hand on a viper, on a cobra or an adder's hole and that he wouldn't be he wouldn't be stricken. He wouldn't die because all of the beasts, all of God's creation are going to have the knowledge of God and they're going to understand the love of God. And, there, and there's not going to be death or sorrow or pain, or tears, or crying, hallelujah, because, because Jesus' glory and his knowledge is going to cover the face of the earth, and, and that's so beautiful, right, because that's part of what God has called us to do, is to partner with him, and to believe him, that that is going to come to pass, 
And it is going to come to pass. I wanted to share you. I switched over to the NASB version. And you don't have to follow me on this, Haley. But I wanted to share with you in the NASB because it's easy for me to go to other passages. But the whole earth is full of his glory is what we just read. I wanted, I wanted to share with you. I just saw this. I thought it was so good. <coughs> in Numbers chapter 14. In Numbers chapter 14, Moses sends out spies. Right? And the ten spies... They go out into the promised land, which is Canaan, right? God promised. You do know that, that modern day Israel used to be called Canaan land, all right? The old songs in the old Pentecostal church, I think they had one called Beulah land or something like that, right? Old hymns, y'all don't know about all that, all you young folk, but we used to sing those kind of songs, amen? And, and I don't even know the words to it, but I know it was good because it talked about the promised land, amen? And, and they sent out the spies, and many of you know the story, and what they did was they were supposed to go spy out the land. It's like a reconnaissance mission. And they were supposed to go check, go, go out there and tell us what the land looks like. Tell us if the people are strong. Tell us what the fruit looks like. They said, man, look, when they got carried some grapes back, I'm just telling you what the Bible says. I believe the Bible. Hallelujah. How I believe the Bible. It said two men had to carry a cluster of grapes on one stick. It took two men to carry it. It was harvest time. And they carried them graves back to show. But this is the problem. They ran into some trouble. They saw the giants in the land. They saw the sons of Anak. They saw the Nephilim, the descendants of Anak in the land. And they said when they saw these giants that basically it caused their heart to melt with fear. Because they said that we were like grasshoppers in their eyes. And that's how they looked at us too. You know, this wasn't part of what I plan on saying, but if you feel like a grasshopper in the eyes of your enemy, he probably sees you that way too. Come on. The good news is, is that you don't have to be a grasshopper in the eyes of your enemy. Hallelujah. Because look, you know what an enemy would do if he saw a grasshopper and he thought was getting in his way? He'd just squash it with his foot. I got good news for you. The word of God says that, that Jesus, the, the, well, it's, called, it's a fancy word, proto-evangelium. What does that mean? The first proclamation of the gospel, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, said that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. Yes. Hallelujah. So Jesus that crushed him like he was a grasshopper. And in Christ, you and I have freedom and liberty. We have the power of the Holy Spirit to walk in victory over the forces of evil. We don't have to fear that. I want to encourage you to know that. We don't have to live under a spirit of fear. We don't have to live under a spirit of anxiety. The Holy, the Word of God says, cast your cares upon Him, for He cares for you. The, in the Greek, the word is anxieties. Cast your anxieties upon Him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's given us freedom. Yes. I believe that. So they went out there, though, and they were supposed to bring back a report. And the Word of the Lord says that they came back. And only two of them had a good report. The other ones were stricken with fear. They said, we can't do it. But Joshua and Caleb, they had a good report. One of them said, they're like bread for us. Can you imagine a piece of bread? Just imagine if you had an enemy, if you were at war, and, and you said your enemy was like, and they're bread for us. Like a little piece of white bread. Just, we just tear that and we eat it. It's nothing for our Lord. Like, that's faith. Confidence in the God that they serve. They were ready to die for this. Amen. And I was I was seeing in this passage of scripture how they didn't think that they could do it. Right? And then the Lord he comes back and he says, My servant Caleb, because he has had a different spirit and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land which he entered, and his descendants shall take possession of it. But in verse 21 of Numbers 14, this is what it say, says, and I, I, I don't think I've ever noticed this before. Now, the Lord put this on my heart about the earth is filled with his glory. And over the last couple of days, it's progressed in my mind, okay? And this is where the Lord is bringing me with all of this. But I just happened upon this scripture earlier while I was here at the church. Verse 21, but indeed, as I, as I live, this is the Lord saying, indeed, as I live, all the earth, Will, will be filled with the glory of the Lord. Now, I, I want to I say something about this. And truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Do you know what the context is right here? The context is this. God said he has given you the victory. 
God said that he would go before you and he would give you the victory. God said through his servant, Caleb and Joshua, that those giants are no match for the God of Israel. But the camp shrinks back in fear. The Lord would say, as surely as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. The Lord wants you and I to know this, that his, this earth is going to be filled yeah. with his glory. And let me tell you what he's looking for right now. Listen, I just talked to you about the millennial reign of Christ. I just talked to you about the flip-flop. I just talked to you about the day when the spirit of the Lord is going to be on the face of the earth. But right here, right now, he's looking for people that would believe him and to be filled with his Holy Spirit. And to begin to move into the areas where he has called us to go. Hallelujah. Listen, we had a little bit of trouble getting into the jail. But hallelujah, I had my first meeting this morning. Praise God, I had about eight or nine guys in there that showed up. And we're going to get more people in there. It's just going to take us a little bit of time. But we got, I, I saw an opportunity. I put my foot in the door. And praise the Lord. Preach the gospel. Preach the gospel, amen. And people were asking, well, how, what must I do to be saved? How, how do I get saved? Uh, I don't want to keep going back. I, I, I want to give my life to, there was one guy on the inside of there that had been in the church before. I didn't really recognize him. He said, I've been to your church. And then he told me later, I don't want to say it on the camera, who he came with. And he told me, go back by there and pray for her house. And, you know, all this kind of stuff like that. Hallelujah. And then whenever we're leaving, the, 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 the lady, the guard, she left me in there for a little while. And, told me, and you know what's funny is, I just got to start learning how to, I just got to start learning to understand that it's not my thoughts all the time. And that is the Holy Spirit. I, I'm telling you right now. I said, so you're going to take the, the prisoners first? She said, yes, I don't care. I'm like, absolutely. And then all of a sudden, not long after, she, I said, I, this is what I, I thought. This would, obviously, this is what the Holy Spirit told me. She's going to get distracted. And, and, and for a moment, she's going to forget about you. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I thought, I, I thought I was thinking that. Yeah. Right? And she was only, she wasn't really even going that long. But when she came back, she, she, I said, I thought you were going to forget about me. She said, I did. She said, she said, I was coming back and somebody distracted me. And for a second, I forgot about you. You see that? I just, just got to start learning. What, all right? Hallelujah. But look, when we're walking out, all of a sudden, this other gentleman comes walking in with the food carts. And he stops it to where we can't get out. And he said, I got a question. I said, what you got, boss? Big old dude. He said, would you stand in agreement with me that I get filled with the Holy Spirit and speak oh, yeah. in other tongues? Hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. I started praying for that brother, speaking in other tongues, praying the baptism of the Holy Spirit over his life. He didn't get filled right then and there, but I know that brother wants to get filled. Yeah. Amen. And when we were walking out, the guard told me, she said, thank you for doing that. Oh, she man. said, he's a preacher's son. Oh, and she said, he means business and he wants to do right. What a blessing. What a blessing. And what I'm trying to say is, as, long, as sure as I live, the glory of the Lord will fill the earth. And he's looking for a people that will be filled with his glory and that will go where he's telling them to go. Hallelujah. He wants to fill you. He wants to fill you up and he wants to use your church. And he wants to use us on the outside of the walls of this church. And I'll tell you why I keep praying it. Because the Lord wants to do it. The Lord wants to do something in you so that he can do something through you. He wants to take you outside the walls of this church. He wants you to lay hands on the sick in Walmart. He wants you to lay hands on the sick at your workplace. He wants you to minister to those that are sick in their heart. He wants, to, he wants you to pray that they receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He wants you to carry Jesus outside and to let the glory of the Lord fill the earth. He's putting us to work. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. There's also a psalm, Psalm 72, 19. Blessed be his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. That's why I wanted to open that door right there. I know it seems a little silly, but no, it doesn't really. Y'all felt it too. Y'all know it was right to open up that door. I want to speak the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 
Thank you, Jesus. The whole earth is full of his glory. Praise you, Jesus. You know, I was thinking that the Lord also put Jeremiah 18 on my heart. And Jeremiah 18 is where the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. And he said to him, he said, arise and go down to the potter's house. Rise and go down to the potter's house. There I'm going to show you. I'm going to cause you to hear my words. And then I went down to the potter's house. And behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was more than the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel that seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter? Said the Lord, behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in mine hand, O house of Israel. So the house of Israel was in the hand of the potter. Amen. And, and he said that the clay was looking like it was marred. See, the truth is, is that God created Adam out of unmarred clay. The clay wasn't marred whenever God reached down there and formed it out of the earth and breathed his life-giving spirit. But after the fall of man, the clay became marred. And the reality of it is, it's just not Israel, our big brother, that was marred. But the truth is, is that you and I, we are made of marred clay. But the good news is this, is that if we will allow ourselves to be placed on the potter's will. And I know I've said this many a times, but the Lord put it back on my heart again because he wants you to know. He wants to form you. He wants to conform you. He wants to form us and conform us into the image of his dear son, Jesus. Oh. See, that's what the Lord offers. He wants to conform us. And, and matter of fact, I want to go to that. Can you go to that for me, Haley? Romans chapter 8. And I was going to start at verse 29, but I really want to go up a little bit. Maybe we'll start at verse, uh, let's see, 26 maybe. I'm going to go ahead and switch over to the King James so we're reading the same thing. We're going to start at Romans chapter 8, verse 26. Actually, let's, uh, let's, let's go to verse 24. Sorry. Romans 8, verse 24. You ready? For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man sees, why does he yet hope for? You know, that's, an encur that's a word that is meant to encourage us. That whenever we realize sometimes that the very thing that we're hoping for hasn't been manifest yet in our life. That God wants us to continue to hope. Yeah. And to believe yes. him and to trust him. Amen. Because his promises are yes and amen. Yes. And sometimes he's got a reason why he lets it linger or tarry. He's doing a work on the inside of us and he wants us to trust him yes. through it. Right. And so so we are saved by hope. Right. But he says this. But if we hope for that, we see not. Then do we with patience wait for it. So even though I don't see it, Lord, I'm going to hope. Even though I don't see it, Lord, I'm going to trust. Even though I don't see it, I'm going to believe that you are the God that can and will make it happen. Amen. And then he goes on to say this, because see, when you're hoping and you're waiting and you're trusting and it's not happening, sometimes those situations are pretty tough. I don't know. You Maybe you've never been through any tough situations. I've been through some tough situations. Some of my situations probably ain't near as tough as some of yours. Right. But, but I've been through some tough. I'm going through some tough situations. I want to hold on to the Lord. Amen. And look, he, and so sometimes when I'm going through them, I don't even know how to pray. Likewise, the spirit helps my infirmity. And that word infirmity can mean physical sickness, but it can also mean spiritual weakness. He helps my weakness. Why? For Because I don't even know what I ought to pray. But the spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings, which cannot be uttered. He that searches the hearts knows what is the mind of the spirit. Now, that's beautiful. Yes. The, the spirit of God lives on the inside of you. You know, what, you know what the word of God says? I think it's in the letter to the Corinthian church. It says this, that who knows the mind of God save the spirit of God. That's right. And now the spirit of God lives on the inside of you. Yes. And so the spirit of God that knows the mind of God lives on the inside of you. He also knows your mind. God, he knows how to take this, the mind of God and to speak to your mind so that your will and his will will line up so that the Holy Spirit will speak to you and give you divine revelation and we will learn how to hear the whisper of the Lord. He searches the hearts. He knows what is the mind of the Spirit because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. The will of God is that 
we all get along and we all walk in unity towards doing the work of God together, right? Can we all agree on that at least? Praise God. That we would all be in unity. That we would become the body of Christ. That we would let him be the head. Yeah. That we would be the body. Yeah. That we would do the work of the Amen. Lord. Amen. And he could do great things. Yes. Yes. Just imagine if the whole church across the globe was like, wow. Yes. Do it. That would be powerful. Yes. That would be so powerful. Yes. Do it, Lord. Nothing is impossible for God. Yes. I can promise you this. I'm not trying to get into end time eschatology or timing right now. I'm really not. I promise you. I don't want to go down that road right now. But let's just pretend for a second that times get really, really tough. There might be an opportunity if, if we start getting shook up. Why does it take that? No, I'm just trying to ask you a question. Why does it take for us many times? I'm not talking about all of you guys. Some of you guys might already be seeking the Lord. You don't need to get shook up. Hallelujah. But why does it take for most of us, me included, to get shook up before we'll really start Crying out. Why did it take a 9-11 for people to come back to church for about a year? <laughs> right? I mean, I'm serious. Why does it take? I don't know why it does. But Lord, all I know is this. I desire to see the glory of the Lord fill the earth. I desire to hear the name of Jesus preached in the, and out in the open for the name of Jesus to change people's lives. Right? <laughs> but even in the midst of these things, look what the word says in 8, in 828. I, I went way backwards to get to 29. But look. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are, who are the called according to his purpose. So no matter what you're going through, you have hope. You're not seeing it, but you're still hoping. You don't know how to pray because the times are tough, but the spirit makes intercession for you. And he groans through you and he helps your infirmities and your weaknesses because he prays through you and he strengthens you. Even in the hard times, the tough times, he grabs a hold of you and he says, come on, we can make this. We can do this together. Hallelujah. Matter of fact, I'm dependent on you. Oh, no, the Holy Spirit is wanting you to know I'm depending on you. Yeah, I can find somebody else to do it, but I don't want somebody else to do it. I want you to do it. That's why I called you. That's why I called you by your name. And I filled you with my spirit. And I've been talking to you. And I've been speaking to you. And I want to use you. He wants to use you. He wants to use me. That is an awesome invitation. All things work together for your hard times, your good times, all things work together. This is where I wanted to bring you. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Wow. See, I saw this verse even with a little bit more light than I've seen it in the past. Because usually I just read a little snapshot right there. But then I read it in the whole context right here. And I'm like, wow, okay. So I'm hoping for things. My hope for things isn't always coming to pass. I'm, the Holy Spirit knows the will of God. He begins to pray through me. He begins to utter groanings for me. He begins to give strength in the midst of my infirmities. And in, in the midst of all of that I'm going through, he causes all things to work together for good to those that know the Lord. And then the next thing you know, he's conforming me. Through the trial, the tribulation, and the things of life, I'm on the potter's wheel. And here we go again. He's molding. He's molding as I'm yielding. See, whenever I decide not to yield, and instead I stiffen my neck, then as that, you ever watch the potter on the clay? You know what I'm saying? The thing gets all askew, and it starts looking weird, and, and then it falls. Well, that's what happens whenever we stiffen our neck and we make our head like flint with the Lord. But if we don't, if we make ourselves pliable, he conforms. It means to be fashioned like unto. So he's fashioning us to look like his son. I was sharing with somebody recently. I don't think I said it in the church. I think I said it to somebody on the phone. Not that I've talked to a lot of people on the phone, praise God. And we're, all, we're usually always having church whenever I'm talking to people. And I can remember thinking to, my, to myself, that one time I was going through something and I was, I was frustrated and I was like, ooh, this hurts. And, you know, the Lord reminded me about two weeks prior, I was praying, 
Make me look like your son, Lord. Make me like Jesus, Lord. And then I'm going through this stuff, and then the Holy Spirit says, said, oh, you don't remember that prayer you prayed? Oh, my God. But, but look at what they're doing, Lord. They're not doing what, you're, what they're supposed to do. But they might not be praying that prayer right now. You prayed the prayer, son. You prayed the prayer and you said you wanted to look like my son. Did you pay attention to what they did to him? Did you pay attention to how they treated my son? I don't. You must have skipped that class. No, you need to stay strong. You need to endure and you need to learn how to lower yourself under my mighty hand. And you allow yourself to be fashioned and conformed into the image of my son to be molded. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for molding us. Amen. So we're on the potter's wheel. We're being conformed. And then he's turning us into, you can go to this one if you, if you like, Haley, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7. God is molding clay, conforming people into the image of his son that they might be vessels used for his glory. Look what this scripture says right here. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. You know what that means? He made us out of earth. We're fallible. At times we look weak. But he puts his glory in. And he reveals himself through his glory in the earth, through these earthen vessels. See, even though sometimes when you're going through things and you're struggling, if you'll hold on to the Lord, he'll bring you through. Everybody may not see what God's doing in your life. Many people may instead choose to look at the times that you stumbled and you fell. But if you'll stay strong and you'll get back up, the proverb said, a righteous man, get up seven times. Right, that's right. If you keep getting up, sooner or later, you ain't going to keep stumbling. Right. Next thing you know, you're going to be helping somebody else get up. Yes, and while everybody might not take notice, thank you, brother. And while everybody might not take notice, somebody's going to take notice. Right. Look at that brother over there. Look at that sister over there. They ain't falling no more. They're helping other people get up. Hallelujah. We're to get enough people. Amen. By the grace of the Lord, through the power of the Holy Spirit, he wants to help us to get up. He put his glory in these earthen vessels. And you see, while God offers this fashioning with his hands so that his glory can fill the land, man, like it Babel, uses his hands to form bricks with clay and mortar, forming his own will, his own kingdom. At least that's what he thinks. He thinks he's forming his own will. He thinks he's forming his own plan. Come, let us make a name for ourselves. Let us make a city for ourselves. Let us make bricks. But in reality, what man does outside of the will of God is he actually helps to fulfill the plan of evil. So man is forming his own outside of God, but God wants to form and conform us into the image of his son so that instead of us receiving glory, Jesus will receive. Right. See, you ever notice that about Babel? They say, come, let us make a name for ourselves. Mankind, that's what he wants. Many times he wants glory for himself, but not us. That's not who we are. We want to give our glory to the king. Amen. So in Isaiah 6, we went through verse 3. I want to go back to verse 4. If you could go to Isaiah chapter 6, verse 4. It says, In the foundations of the threshold, Isaiah 6, verse 4, And the foundations of the threshold trembled at the voice of him. Well, let me go. I'm sorry. I'm going to read it from, from this one. The post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Keep going through the verses. Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips and dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Verse 6. Then flew one of the seraphim unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. Verse 7. He touched my mouth. He laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched your lips and your iniquity is taken away and your sin is purged. Let's look at verse 8. 
Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I. Send me. Wow. Praise God. I mean, it, to see the glory of the Lord. And again, you know, listen, I don't want to make too big of a deal about this, but I'm going to make a big deal about it. I'm just telling you what's hap what happens to me. Whenever I seem to get closer to the Lord, I, I see how holy he is. And when I see how holy he is, yeah. I just have a desire to be more like him. And I realize I'm not right. And so I cry out that he would do more. Yeah. I don't want you to think I walk away feeling beat up. It's not like that. I, I feel refreshed. Yeah. I feel cleansed. Yeah. I do. But, but I'm just saying what's happening to me as I get closer to him. And then I realize that maybe, not maybe, at times I did. I made mistakes. I hope yeah. it's okay if I'm sharing that with you. Yeah. You know, I made mistakes. Not, not just mistakes. A sin fell short. Wasted time. Wasted time. But he's a restorer of time. Yes, yes, yes. I believe that. He'll redeem the time. Yes, yes. So don't, don't be living in, in, in bondage to that. But, but at some point in time, we got to realize what, what's going on. we got to, by the grace of God, break the cycle. Right. And, and then start moving forward. That's right. well, well, what, are, what are we going to do? What do you need me to do, preacher? I, I just need us all to agree that we're going to pray and ask God to move <laughs> in our hearts, in our church services. That when people show up, I'm not going to quit saying it. That when people show up, the Holy Spirit will descend in here and that he'll minister to them. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Y'all have seen, y'all been in services before, even in some of our services where the Holy Spirit's moving, where the presence of the Lord is. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. The Holy Spirit will begin to break bondages and set the captive free. I believe that. He'll change us. Amen. And so he said that. And, and, and he said, you know, so, so then he realizes he's unclean, and, but he's touched by the coal. And then, he's, and then his sins are, they're, they're forgiven. Well, you know, I was thinking, too, I wanted to say this. In the year King Uzziah died, I know I've said this before, but if you do a word study on that name for that king, the idea is strength. And in the, in the year that his strength died, he saw the Lord. But I also want to say this. So many times we'll put our, our focus on other things that we look to, to draw, to draw strength from. And it's not always the Lord, if we're honest with one another. Sometimes we'll put, we think that this thing here is either going to give me strength or it's going to help me in the situation that I'm going through. Right? But, so sometimes there's things in our life that are getting in the way of God. And it's when those things die and are moved out of the way that many times we're able to see the Lord. Or it's in the midst of the struggle that we're broken enough to where we can break through and we really see the Lord in all of his glory. And he begins to do a work in our heart and in our lives. But when he touched him, let's look at verse 8. I don't think I read that part yet. Verse 8 of Isaiah chapter 6. Also, I heard the Lord they heard the voice of the Lord saying, who shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here am I, send me. I did say that, right? And, and so I was thinking, wow, how beautiful is that? Send me, Lord, I want to go. And I was thinking about Isaiah 61. You know, that's one of the, that's the verse that Solomon gave a word over our church. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captain, captives, to, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. This is the part I want to get yeah. to. That they might be called trees of righteousness. The planting of the Lord. Why? That he might be glorified. What a beautiful opportunity. Yes, Lord, I want Isaiah's, I want Isaiah's call. Send me, Lord. I want to preach the gospel. I want to preach your truth. I, anoint me, Lord, to preach the gospel like the anointed Jesus. 
That the captive would be set free. That the brokenhearted would be healed. That they would be like the plantings of the Lord. Hallelujah. Trees of righteousness. And that the glory of the Lord would fill the earth. Amen? Amen. But that's not what he told us. Oh, why you got to be negative, preacher? I'm not being negative. I'm giving you the balance. This is what he said. See, even if, and hallelujah, we will see people like trees planted by the water yes. that bear their fruit in season. We will see those plantings of the Lord, the righteousness of God, that give glory to God. We're going to see it. We won't always see it as much as we want to. It won't always come as quickly as we want to. But I'll tell you this. This is what the Lord told Isaiah. He said this in verse 9. He said, this is going back to Isaiah chapter 6. Verse 9, he said, go tell this people, hear ye indeed, but understand not. See ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat. The NASB says, make the heart of this people insensitive. The idea of fat, I've taught it before. It's kind of like if you cook bacon and you left the grease in an iron skillet, you woke up in the morning, it was still in there, that congealed fat that's in the bottom of the pan. It's a layer of fat over the heart, prevents the seed from reaching where it was supposed to reach. Make the heart of this people fat, make their ears heavy, shut their eyes. See, when you bring the same anointing of the gospel, this is the word of the Lord. I didn't make this up. The same anointed preaching of the gospel that will plant trees of righteousness near living waters that will bear fruit in their proper season, that will produce plantings of righteousness so that the Lord might be glorified. That same anointing and that same truth when it's preached to those that reject it will cause our heart to become fat. It's a scary thing. That people can sit in churches and the truth would go forward and they, the whole time they're amening, the whole time they're saying yes, and in reality, their heart is becoming hardened. I'm not saying who does and who doesn't. That's not what I'm saying. What a Brother Lawson used to say, the same son that softens butter hardens clay. It's the same gospel that softens a heart that will harden a heart that rejects it. Jesus said in Luke chapter 10, I believe it is, he said, if they reject you, they rejected me. And if they reject me, they reject the one that sent me. So if they're rejecting you and I, it's not really us that they're rejecting. They're rejecting the Jesus that we preach. Now, we do have to be careful that our personality isn't getting in the way, that, our, that we're just not ornery, and that we're just not obnoxious. But at the same time, listen, if the Holy Spirit is anointed you, it's not always going to be peaches and cream, my friend. And sometimes it's going to be a powerful and anointed, a bluntly given word of the Lord, because that's how the prophet spoke. And sometimes it's going to be an encouraging word that's going to lift the spirits. It's going to exhort and edify the people. Amen. It's going to strengthen. It's going to water. It's going to bring fruit. Amen. Hallelujah. Man rejects because he wants to build his own kingdom sometimes. You know, at Babel, they came together in one mind and in one language, right? Under the command of Nimrod. In rebellion against the word of God. See, the word of God said, whenever Noah got off the boat, I want you to replenish the earth. Yes. Now think about this. All this stuff is interconnected. Why you want us to replenish the earth? Because I, as I live, I have said, the glory of the Lord will fill this earth. <clears throat> and in order for the glory of the Lord to fill this earth, I need somebody to proclaim my glory. And in order for the whole earth to be able to proclaim my glory, I need people all over the face of the earth. And I told Noah to replenish the earth. And you, under rebellion against with the enemy, have chosen instead to collectively keep yourself in one place. Just like the children of Israel refused to go into the promised land and to take the land. As surely as he's standing here before you, he would say... As long as I live, I'm here to tell you the glory of the Lord is going to fill the earth. And the only question that he would have for you and me, brothers and sisters, is will we be part of bringing that glory that is allowed to fill the earth? Yes. Yes. 
And so they instead stayed together under the command of Nimrod in rebellion against the word of the Lord. And so what did God do? He confused their language. And now this is one beautiful thing about Pentecost. This is one of those things that we don't think a lot about. But in the upper room, they came together in one mind and one accord. See, they were in one mind and one accord in Babel, but they were in rebellion against God, right? They were all together. They had one language. They were all together, right? And at, and on, at Pentecost, they came together, one mind, one accord. The Spirit of God fell. They were filled. And they were not drunk, as you suppose. This is that which the prophet Joel spoke of, that in the last days, that he would pour out the Spirit upon all flesh. Amen? Yeah. Now, all of these people began to speak in other tongues. And all of the people that were there for the Pentecost heard them in their own language. So where at one time everybody was in rebellion speaking one language, but they were all in unity in rebellion. Now Jesus says, wait for me in the upper room. Hallelujah. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit of my Father when he comes upon you. And now they begin to speak in other tongues. Hallelujah. And, but they're still in all one mind, one accord, and everybody can hear the wonderful works of God. And if you will remember the purpose... The purpose of the power is that you would be witnesses for me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the outermost part of the world so that the glory of God would be preached to all nations, tribes, and tongues. Hallelujah. Revelation chapter 5, after we see an image in heaven and it says, You are worthy, O Lamb of God, for you are redeemed with your blood men from every tongue, tribe, and nation. As long as, as long as sure as he's alive, he wants you to know the glory of the Lord is going to fill this earth. Hallelujah. He wants to use us. He wants to use his church. And you and I need to yield to him. Yes. Yield to the spirit and let him fill us up. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Singers, musicians, y'all can come up. Please come up. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. I like this scripture. It says, uh, in Hebrews 2, 10, it says, For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. So you know what I forgot to say earlier? That scripture, I never saw that before. Let me, you, you, you don't have to go there, but I want to just mention something. That Romans 8, 29. For no, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. I don't know that I ever saw this before, but look. What that's talking about. So if we're going to be conformed into the image of his son, that Jesus is the firstborn among many brethren. He's the first one to cross over to the other side, right? He's the first one to receive his glorified body. He's the firstborn of, with a glorified body. Hallelujah. And the Lord is wanting us to be supernaturally conformed into the image of our Lord. Amen. I'm not trying to say you're going to get your glorified body on this side, but what I'm trying to say is, He's fashioning us into the image of our of his son. But I wanted to share this with you on Hebrews 2.10. That word captain. I got this. I got I did a little screenshot. It, part, of, part of the word for captain, it's a chief leader. Uh, it means it says captain. But you know what else it means? It means pioneer. And that's something, you, you know, you think of pioneers back in the old days, how they would go through the mountains and they would make maps and they would they would go into the land first. And the scripture teaches that Jesus was our the pioneer of our salvation. He went he went before us into uncharted territory. He said, "Father, into your hands I commit my spirit." He trusted the Father on the other side. And 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 he went there for us. And we can trust him. Amen. I don't know about you. I just want to worship the Lord. Amen. I know that he's doing a work in each and every one of our hearts and lives. 
I just want to give him glory. Amen. Pray that he'd fill us up. Pray that he'd empower us and that he would continue to use us. Amen.